if I take uh, this place in order to speak to you, it is not only to play better the role of the German professor, it's also to be able to show some images that are linked with my, and it is difficult to do it from this place. My uh, contribution depends on the supposition that the world has to be looked at not only through categories, but also by way of the senses. What kind of trivial remark you might say, but who would actually agree that law is color, smell, gesture, reading, discussion, logical argumentation and seduction and not just the text? And who might actually accept and take seriously the fact that the mediums, the windows through which we see the organs, through which we smell and feel and suffer, are the arts? Let me share some examples. Cannon and Canoon give a wonderful idea of the double meaning in law and music, opera, orchestration. Musicians and jurists with a double career would uh, deliver manifold examples, not only for the elective affinities, but also for the power of transmitting messages without words, appealing to the emotions and the effects that jurists try to suffocate in general for their systematic and rationalizing attempts of ordering the world. The list of relevant arts is long and has yet to be exhausted. Film, video, art, comic art, sculpture, performance, theater, and my last discovery and project for the future, I can tell it now, the circus as the space where the laws of nature do not exist and the acrobat seems to transcend. Where is uh, our good friend Hans Vorländer? That's transcendation the limitations of our human condition with a triumphal gesture. I am convinced that all these arts are sometimes much more apt to bridge the differences by safeguarding a plurality of worldviews, gazes and smells of the law. Those places are, for example, the spaces where the law is taught. And I come back to a discussion we had at Abu Dhabi, at the Inn of Court, in the madrasas of Islamic teaching or rabbinic uh, education in the Hörsaal, which is inadequately translated as lecture room into English. These locations of legal education, not to forget the repetitorium in German tradition, some of you have undergone this kind of treatment, must represent the color and the smell of the law, the rhetoric and the other, uh, the obiter picta of legal cultures the materiality of constitutions and texts of the pleading lawyer as well as the other roles of the juristic personnel. I was pleased that this proposal found astonishingly enough some acceptance during a conference I was mentioning about glo global legal education this year at NYU Abu Dhabi. Without overloading this attempt much with too much methodology. For example, borrowing some nice ideas from Georg Simmel's sociology of the senses, or Bruno Latour's sociology of the thing or the thing, or Pierre Bourdieu's analysis of the force du droit. I would like to present some examples and hopefully make some conclusions of a more general kind even about the necessity to build a new turn in cultural studies, that is, whether we will need a material turn in this direction, a kind of new materialism in the analysis of the law that would be to be opposed to the bold pretension of a Kelsen and a Weber and a Parsons not to fall into the fallacy of misplaced concreteness by doing so a fallacy of misplaced abstractness may occur with the risk of overlooking the sensitive side of the law as we will see in the conclusion or as Bruno Latour has said, les juristes parlent toujours des textes mais rarement de leur matérialité. 
So I come to some material con conditions of the American Constitution. The paradoxical claim of a normative order that is also binding for the sovereign first takes shape in the American Revolution. Thereafter, the Constitution is the highest law and the single source of legitimate sovereign power. It was used, issued in the act of exceptional legislation through the pouvoir constituant and then materialized in a, constitu a constitutional charter as a secular expression of Protestant belief in script as stated by Preuss. Similarly, in his study on the emergence of human rights, uh, this Georg Jelinek had anticipated Weber's work on the connection between Protestant ethics and the spirit of modernity. He had the revolutionary breakthrough to English parliamentary absolutism is not that ruler is replaced, but that the basis for ruling is converted to a consensus of those subjected to rule. In doing so, there uh, freedom is ensured both internally and externally. So I have to say a little bit also about the United Kingdom, of course, in presence of people who know it much better than me. Uh, I'm, I feel a little bit embarrassed, but however, I have to try. Uh, by using the idea of a ruler's consensus dependency, a problem concerning the continuation of a charismatic consensus arises, and this occurs through juridification. Unlike many other nations, the UK does not have a single constitutional document. This is sometimes expressed in an oversimplified manner by stating that it has an uncodified or unwritten constitution. Much of the British constitution is embodied in written documents, such as within statuses, court judgments, uh, works of authority and treaties. The Constitution has other unwritten sources, including parliamentary constitutional conventions, the cornerstone of the legislative British Constitution since the Glorious Revolution of 1688 has been described by various experts uh, as the doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty, that is, the statuses, legal acts passed by Parliament are the UK's supreme and final source of law not any other kind of normative power, if I understand correctly. From there, it follows that Parliament can change the Constitution in the formal sense by simply passing new Acts of Parliament. There was some debate about whether the principle of parliamentary sovereignty remained valid in the light of the UK's former, former or still existing membership of the European Union. This issue was naturally one used by the supporters of leaving the Union in the 2016 referendum vote known as Brexit now appears to be leading the United Kingdom out of the legal jungle of Brussels. I'm not sure whether this is true or not. Uh, at least there, the jungle is very visible on the other side. Normativity that, uh, and their production mode uh, at Brussels was one of the points of critique that the Leavers at least brought forward in order to have a conflict about legal cultures as the background of the leaving movement. That's interesting uh, uh, enough, I think. A constitution as the system of naturally viewed administrative rules in which a growing and handed down political culture is embedded requires no explicit constitutional, constitutional document in written form, one could say. However, where it exists, particularly in American constitutional culture, it becomes a part of a widespread production process as explained by Daniel Schulz. He might be there today, yes, because he's the next speaker, so I'm quoting you in order to announce you in the right way. Sie sind in der Rotunda für die Charters of Freedom im Gebäude der National Archives in Washington DC als sakrale Gründungstexte des amerikanischen Gemeinwesens ausgestellt und dort in ein umfangreiches Bildprogramm eingebaut. I don't know whether you will speak about this pictorial program now today, but one can read it in your article. 
I come to my second point, the pathos uh, of the Constitution or the sexualization of the Constitution in France. So I think most of you are very uh, familiar with this trend in uh, constitutional uh, culturing uh, or constitutional or culturing uh, or, or constitutionalizing uh, culture, whatever you want. And you know about the constitutional fever that spread uh, through the country uh, around uh, the 89 uh, uh, revolution. And also, certainly, what could be said, uh, and it was said in Article 16 of the Constitution of 1789, toute société dans laquelle la garantie des droits n'est pas assurée, ni la séparation des pouvoirs déterminés, n'a point de constitution. So this is a very material, substantive uh, idea and concept of constitution that was also uh, responsible for that kind of constitutional fever. Thus in France, the point is not whether there is a constitutional God, as Di Fabio claimed it for Germany, but if the constitution itself contains a divine glamour, as can be seen in numerous formulations and symbolic representations of French constitutionalism, we have at least seen some of them uh, even uh, yesterday, uh, from the declaration of the human rights as bi Bible-like decalogue as part of the cult of the être suprême in Louis David's Le Sermon du jeu de pomme, uh, or the death of Marat, thus contradicting tendencies of pure sacralities of textual and visual narratives full of revolutionary pathos collide. So I come to, to another point, um, to Bruno Latour uh, again. In La Fabrication du Droit, Bruno Latour uh, revealed the material side of this constitution as it is applied in the Conseil d'État. As Latour has made a neo-materialist point of view most prominent, remaining to my understanding in the tradition of Durkheimism more than in Tardism, uh, Gabriel de Tarde, uh, that he would like to bring forward, he prefers uh, him for theoretical reasons, a reading of his book might elucidate the two sides of the coin the theoretical access to constitutions, materialities, uh, and some lights on the specific French case. Quoi de plus grisâtre, de plus poussière, de plus méprisable que des piles de dossiers. Or, il existe un traceur qui organise toute l'activité du Conseil, qui fait l'objet de tous les soins, de toutes les conversations qui permet d'aller sans solution de continuité depuis la plainte la plus inarticulée jusqu'au plus sublime point de doctrine. Et même cet ersatz de vie éternelle que procure le bon, c'est le, vous le savez très très bien c'est quoi, c'est le dossier, das die Akte, tout à fait du moins dans nos pays de droit écrit, a pour enveloppe corporelle une chemise cartonnée liée par des élastiques. Ça, c'est le droit. That's the law. The fold is the center of attention in our culture, culture of documentality. As Maurizio Ferraris has rightly called it, no wonder that they are at the focus of Daumier's representation of the law and its personnel or in an adoption when representing Weber and Durkheim as jurists. Anselm Kiefer, no less sensible to German traditions, has visualized the power of the folders in some of his installations. May we therefore develop a matrix of laws materialities from the arrangement of the space in courtrooms, the surrounding emblems, the clothes of the, uh, of the juristic personnel, the use of folders, elastics, the hammer, gestures, and the aforementioned dust and glue, 
but can we extract some kind of general insight from these observations to obtain a better understanding of French constitutionalism? If you expect the ethnographer to play the role of the observer of exitism, you will be completely wrong. For Latour, speaking about symbols, sacrifice, tribes and tribunals, rituals, etc., as ethnologists generally do, has not the faintest flair of a mocking attitude. That's important to say in this room also, saying, Pourtant, une fois la minute, d'amusement passé, so if you had your laughter, then afterwards, une fois effacé, le sourire euh, euh, narquois, une telle attitude n'aboutirait qu'à cette forme détestable d'exotisme qu'on peut appeler l'occidentalisme. He's hence joining a personal remark with Anselm Kiefer, who held a wonderful exhibition about the Russian revolutions at St. Petersburg this summer by saying, the reason why I first studied law that I could not imagine my dis any discipline more exotic than jurisprudence. So the German case, and this would be related, how many time do I have? Not very much, I think. No, about 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. And it's fine. Uh, so the German case, what is interesting in the German case, I think it, and we talked about this yesterday, it is not the big pathos, I, the German case after the war. It is a kind of asceticism, and it has to do with the question uh, that in the Rhineland we are Catholics, in general we are Catholics, but we are Protestant Catholics, and this means that there is some kind of a way not to show too much of power. As you can see here, this was the signature by Carlo Schmidt. So a symbolic matches, uh, message is expressed in this outward uh, form. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, there I am in a very interesting case. I mixed up. Uh, India, this is interesting, and uh, Germany, uh, so it is, one can try a lot of things, but this is a little bit, I think, too crazy, and uh, I see simply that uh, the following passage, page six of my talk, is lacking for the moment, very rarely this occurred to me, and this leads me just to, to the images. You see what is interesting, and this image is uh, Adenauer signing the Constitution. And what is interesting that uh, beyond and besides, and instead and despite of his ascetic attitude towards power, though he knew to use power, uh, there is a, a very n a nice symbolism uh, with the pen to uh, really to, to, to make the signature. On the other side, there are s Chinese signs behind declaring uh, uh, that this is for eternity. So this is another element uh, of how to bring uh, the, the fact that this was not a constitution that should be valid forever as we know, but that in the same time there was a hope behind that it would not be just for the very day. I will skip, perhaps not completely, uh, an element where I uh, was asking myself, where is the original of the German constitution? Because we know the, the Washington case, we know and we will see the Russian case, there are a lot of cases where it has become uh, enshrined as a sacred object of the civil religion of constitutionalism in certain countries. For Germany, it is more difficult to find such a place, and uh, in the end, I could find where the original is. But the, it's in Berlin, and uh, I could tell you. But it is not visible, it is not for the public. Uh, and this is interesting. So we are not adoring in the same time, though, as we yesterday discussed, 
there is a specific relationship towards the constitution and we are talking uh, in constitutional semantics in a very loud way and in a way to be convincing but uh, the constitution as such had not been sexualized but uh, how uh, the uh, la relure, uh, as we would say in French, has been made uh, is in a tradition, uh, in a Catholic tradition, and this has once again to do with the Romanian uh, origin of the German constitution. So for the Indian case, very shortly, what is interesting is uh, the fact that this constitution formulated by Gandhi and a certain Dr. Ambedkar, who was a student at Bonn, University of Bonn 21, after whom we named the uh, room next door to the Durkheim Salon in this building, because he is a figure, uh, a constitutional figure for the history of constitutionalism. So, the, the way really to represent the content of this very complex constitution that has to do with the fact of multinationalism that was yesterday explained for the Russian case by Alexander Filipov is of course and remains uh, with regard to the fact that we are still uh, in a, a society uh, of, uh, of car, in a caste society that did not change though the constitution is promising something else this took five years to be written down and how to protect such an object of such wealth it was done in a helium uh, object so that it is really protected for perhaps not for eternity the real eternity but for some kind of secular eternity i come to uh, and this is Ambedkar, Dr. Ambedkar. If you ever have traveled in India, you know that there are everywhere more than 6,000 statues of uh, Mr. Uh, Ambedkar. I come to Russia. A recent voyage to Russia for the sake of the complex celebration of the revolutionary events 100 years ago at Petrograd allowed me to rethink the meaning of revolution as a sociological category as well as the role that constitutional normativity is taking in the logic of revolution. In the Durkheimian paradigm, revolution can be comprehended from the start by using the paradigm's normative background and its own logic of implementing and institutionalizing. By doing so, however, an analysis of revolution as a cultural phenomenon cannot be detached from tension between old and new orders as well as from the obligation of nego negotiation itself due to normative reasons and rights at least of the subjective type to overthrow old normative orders and create a new normative empire. You were talking about that with regard to, uh, to, uh, to Berman. Dermans Anas analysis, and I think this is right, it's very important to understand that even the concept of revolution has to do with the law and the relationship to normativity, to break and on the other side to substitute by something better for the future, for mankind and for the holy person that stands uh, behind. In so far I think uh, uh, it is interesting to have this access to understand uh, the meaning of, in, in, in a very fundamental sense, of revolutions and what they mean uh, for certain societies. So this is, we have seen it yesterday, it is next to the Verfassungsgerichtshof in Petrograd. And this is the shrine in the Boris Yeltsin National Library, the Constitution of 77. Rather interesting, I would say, that this was enshrined uh, and uh, that this is uh, uh, part of an evolving, uh, I would say, civil religion where something seems to be very uh, impressive. And this has to do with the question of ICATS. To gain, gain an understanding 
or that was at least my uh, impression that to get a better understanding of this one has to go back to uh, orthodoxy. To gain an understanding of Russian iconolo iconology one certainly needs a better understanding of what the icon means in orthodox religion. You made a lot of allusions to orthodox religion, religions some minutes ago. My impression is that a lot of misunderstandings are linked to the main ideological topic of the orthodox church, namely what kind of reality the icon represents. Instead of being a symbol as in Protestantism or a personification as in Catholicism, whereas the orthodox icon disposes of an iconic power on its own right. That is why, and this is said to Alexander, the 4th of November is a national holiday in honor of an icon, the one that was flown in an aeroplane over the troops that fought against the German aggressors and were victorious. In the origin, Alexei I declared the, the 22 of October to be national holiday in all of Russia. It was called the Day of Mother of God uh, of Kaz Kazan icon, because Minin and Posharsky were holding the, this icon when marching into Moscow and freeing Russia from Polish rule. Until 1917, this day was celebrated after the revolution of October 22 had been abolished by the Bolsheviki, the 7th of November has instead been celebrated as the day of the revolution year by year. Only in 2004 was a new calendar established by the Duma integrating the day of consent and Eintracht as the revolutionary remembrance uh, had been baptized in order to project the former day of the Constitution into such orthodox iconography. Constitution, orthodoxy and Russian identity were thereby symbolically integrated. This was the coup of the 5th of November. Calendar. I come to my conclusion and I don't have very much time I see two, three minutes. So the question remains how to grasp the material and the sensitive dimension of the law. Uh, at the end, I would now like to come back to my starting point, namely that a legal theory of the senses is needed in order to grasp what the eyes can see, uh, the face can recognize, the ear may hear about the law, the nose may smell as right or wrong, the sense of touch can feel even when dignity is just untouchable according to the German constitution. And what about uh, a sense of justice? Does it need more than doctrinal sophistication? And what are the risks if it supersedes legal reasoning? So I, I have prepared a little bit to say about the eye. in the sense of, and the tradition of Georg Simmel, the face, the perfume, perhaps uh, at least uh, let me tell you a little bit about the perfume, you, may, you might be interested. Yeah. The sense of smell cannot be pictured, however, the olfactory, not only with Harold and Maud, but also in the arts, has found a legitimate place. Thus advertising also faces a nearly impossible task with visualizing and centralizing, having to operate exactly there where it revolves around senses awareness, the perfume. Already in the semantics of perfume, it refers rather to the intended effects. You know the names of perfumes. Passion or its redemption, guilt. Then to the sensory perfume, uh, uh, sensory qualities themselves will largely escape this verbalization and thus explain why the perfume from Patrick Zuskind poses such a media theoretical wonder. It stifles the scent that it is highly individual, yet should also signal a supposed collective the belonging to a class or stratum. Not only those who work in slaughterhouse, but also those who subscribe in cheap perfumes tell us something about their trade.
podcast, so that's another story. The sense of touch and the untouchable, human dignity is inviolable. Die uh, Würde des Menschen ist unantastbar. Uh, ich freue mich, dass Herr Herd eben gerade auch hier bei uns im Raum ist. For the blind, the sense of touch is a replacement in order to substitute the spatial order of things that is transmitted through sight. The imagination of haptic qualities alone releases the sense of touch from its social constraints, for in, order, in the order of interaction lies contact and also the touching of another, the strictest of rules. Even if studies on social and spatial distance very impressively document that a proper north-south divide exists, take the studies quoted by a social psychologist Argyle, the experience of smoothing and roughening of wool and linen is regulated by the shape of the body. Torture, the numerous forms of everyday violent relationships, point to the central place of society where the sense of touch is at home, the body. We have learned what the blindfold means for Lady Justice from a study by Jose Garcia Gonzalez not only but also the removal of sensuality is thus considered a prerequisite for carrying out justice. I have a very, very last point. A sense of justice. But where is the place of justice? One's thinking in terms of natural law as we taste it from the tree of knowledge is forbidden. Can it be bound in tribunals that had to direct a full dehumanization of the world in the Nuremberg trial that created legal culture and the, the Eichmann trial, the International Court of Justice in The Hague or in the Constitutional Courts, whose prominent representatives we will meet tomorrow, uh, today in the panel, which values must we be sensible of in order to mobilize those emotions of justice? beyond a discredited law of nature and a positivism blind of values? What do we need in order to rise, to speak about the world and thereby give it a meaning? And I come back to the meaning debate we had before. As Weber, not without pathos, demands of a civilizing being he calls Kulturmensch. The fact that only the systematic suppression of moral <laughs> sentiments and feelings of justice may lead to a rational normative order, as a lot of jurists would say, certainly seems ludicrous as every man and every woman knows what a crime injustice is. The implementation of a sense of justice in times of the globalization of normative orders, of global effects and local justices and injustices that transcends our immediate horizon of feelings for what is justice evident. Can the hand and heart, a sense of justice and belief in a working rule of the world be harmonized by way of law? Is the Constitution the place in which this reconciliation of the senses occurs and not just the belief in the rationality of legal orders is cultivated? That's uh, one of the remaining questions for me. I thank you very much for your attention and your patience with me. Thank you.